And you, you see this kind of propaganda aimed at dividing Sunnis from Shias all over the place these days. And I, I'm very disappointed in the number of Muslims who fall for this. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. It wasn't as big of an issue before. It's become more militarized or more mechanized or weaponized. What is the word I'm looking for? It's become more weaponized. I first saw it in Iraq, uh, when I saw the reports coming. And this is just around the time when they're setting up the green zone. You had people like John Negroponte running around and all of a sudden death squads start popping up. So they were poaching, uh, certain people or bribing certain people, pin, 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 uh, cherry picking them from Shiite militias to form death squads and mixed in with, uh, some radical Sunnis as well. And they wanted to basically, uh, dismantle, uh, Sadr's army. Uh, but dismantle any real uh, militia opposition uh, in Iraq. And that was a long, going to be a long process. They knew it was going to be a long process. It was going to cost a lot of money and a lot of soldiers to, to basically wear that thing down to the point now where they've almost sort of gotten rid of it. And you notice how I- ISIS had a cakewalk through northern Iraq. You know, that would not have happened 15 years ago because there would have been, with the amount of militia, um, Shiite militia that would have been uh, organized and active, they wouldn't have been able to sort of you know, ponce around and take towns and villages. They wouldn't it wouldn't have happened. So you look at how much trouble they're having when they encounter Hezbollah, uh, who've come into Syria to help uh, clean out some of the towns and cities. Um, they would have that same trouble in Iraq. But the U.S. really played upon this division, and this is how the Western uh, mentality, the colonial mentality, will look. At, they look at it like it's a like it's a, a sporting event, and they say, well, "Where are the cracks there?" They did this with Libya too. They managed to find the cracks in Gaddafi's ministers and cabinets, and went and identified some of those people early, got in touch with them, started working with them in advance of the overthrow of that government. This is the same thing in in Iraq too. They'll look at the cracks and they'll use that, try to exploit that in order to maintain control. The British were brilliant at this, and they ended up splitting one of the largest countries in the world into three parts, India, um, strictly along sectarian lines or religious lines. And uh, the U.S. have learned from the best, and the British are the best uh, at that. Um, they understand what the culture differences are, the religious differences are on the ground, and they'll play that very cleverly uh, in a Machiavellian kind of way. The U.S. has just taken that to another level with a bit of brute force uh, and, with, and creating some of these uh, cyclops, uh, organizations like uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS, and they've gotten slightly out of control. This is the other problem, Kevin, is that it starts off as a false narrative, you know, Sunni versus Shia. But if you inject enough violence into it over a long enough period of time, it will it will actually become real a- after a certain number of years. And I think this is the unfortunate thing that we're seeing in the Middle East is that it has become real, but it's only become real because of the constant injecting of money and guns and foreign fighters and toxic news coverage uh, into that situation has created a sectarian problem that will last for a generation. And that, to me, is the big tragedy, um, especially from, from Iraq forward. I agree. You know, Iraq's 9-11, in a sense, was the bombing of the Golden Dome on February 22nd, 2006, and people who were there, the witnesses, reported that in the, the night before the bombing, which occurred in the very wee hours of the morning, U.S. troops actually surrounded it and chased off everybody and cordoned it off. And so this was obviously an inside job to be blamed on extremist Sunnis. And then they mm-hmm. also have done all sorts of, you know, bombings of mosques and markets. You yeah. know, it's usually not Muslims who bomb anybody's mosque. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, unless they really get crazed and desperate. Uh, but to get it going, I think that the occupation in Iraq did a lot of false flags going after yes. civilians, going after mosques. And, and, and now it's taken Kevin. on a life of that's, its own. That's documented, Kevin. Those, those false flags you're talking about are not, that's not conspiracy theory. Those have been reported even in mainstream media. So these are, yeah. that's very real what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the examples was those British special forces guys dressed up as Arabs who were arrested in Basra. They were heading for a market. They were going to blow up a market and uh, they had all the explosives and weapons in their car. They got arrested. And the British brought in tanks to knock down the walls of the prison in Basra 
to mm-hmm. free their special forces false flag <laughs> terrorists. Yep. Uh, and all the prisoners escaped. So they, they freed hundreds and hundreds of prisoners just so that, you know, so they could get these guys out. And, you know, just to shift gears a little bit, you know, that, that huge Golden Dome bombing that was the biggest of all the iconic sorts of sectarian inspiring false flags in Iraq, uh, happened on, on, on the 22nd of February. And I, you know, I was going over these sort of 9-11s of other countries, you know, these big mm-hmm. shock and awe events that have changed everything for these countries. And in a lot of them, the number 11 comes up, you know, like just like mm. with the JFK assassination, we have 1122. Uh, that's like two multiples of 11 in, in three numbers. That's, that's pretty interesting. But here we've got, you know, 911, of course, we've got the, uh, Sp- Spanish 911 was on 31104. Okay. Madrid. So we've yeah. got, the uh well the UK's 911 was 77 but if you put 7 and 7 together you got 77 a multiple 11 so we'll set that aside <laughs> Iraq's golden dome was on 222 India's 911 was 1126 in Mumbai Norway's 911 was on 72211 okay mm-hmm. and Canada's 911 was on 1022 we just passed the first anniversary of that 22 being another multiple and France's 911 was well it culminated on it, the first Charlie Hebdo attack was on the 7th of January last year but then the big march of the millions of lemmings with the identical je suis charlie signs was on 111 uh so yeah an unusually high percentage of these seem to feature the number 11 and you know, if you if you actually go over it statistically, you know, the chances should be, if you have, let's say, you know, just the first two dates, the month and the day, uh, there's two chances to get 11. So that's a you know one in 11 chance. Just call it one in 10 to, for for simplicity. So you got two of those. That would be a you know a, a two in 10 or one in five chance. But when you list all these countries 911s and you find that you know three quarters plus of them all have an 11 there, uh, that's you're beating the odds. And so these numerologist types who say that there's something fishy going on here, that maybe whoever's behind this is interested in these numbers. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're all crazy. Oh, so, so you're saying that 11 is the new 13? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's the new, it's gonna yeah, be the new 13. Captain like Eric May pioneered this line of research. When I first heard him talking, I thought he was, you know, crazy. But, uh, you know, after I looked into, oh, and then the, the number of days between 9-11 and, uh, which was a Madrid bombing, I think it was, it was like 911 days exactly. So Eric May showed me all this stuff, and at first I thought he was nuts, and then I don't know. <laughs> well, these patterns do occur in, in, in the universe, and in, in the natural world, too. You know, you see recurring patterns, and they might seemingly be unexplainable, but in fact, uh, the, it points to, uh, also possibility of some grand design, at least on that, on that binary level, you know, so it's, it's certainly possible. I wouldn't count it out, because it does occur in so many other places in the universe, so it's like, uh, w- why, why wouldn't it occur as well with events and, uh, related events and things like that? It's very possible, of course. Right, right. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist in the sense that I think that a lot of these great crimes are you know, not done by lone nuts or whoever the patsy is supposed to be. But I'm also, you know, a coincidence theorist. Now, we always insult the coincidence theorists who, you know, try to explain away obvious conspiracies by saying it's a coincidence. But I am a coincidence theorist in the sense that I do believe that there are these meaningful coincidences that just get generated, you know, by the universe or you call them signs of God or call them whatever you want. Synchronicities is what Carl Jung called them. These meaningful coincidences where meaning uh, just, you know, jumps into the world in a way that would totally destroy any kind of odds. Uh, yeah. Jung gave us millions of examples of this, but everybody's experienced these things. And, and mm. so, is that, is that what you were suggesting? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's either that or it's that guy, like in Time Bandits, you know, the, uh, the, the super, uh, technocrat dictator, uh, psychopath who, who's, who's engineering events according to the numerology, uh, because everything has to be spaced out exactly so that they can manage all the fallout in between. It's either that or it's what you just said, which is the more the Carl Jungian. Uh, meaningful coincidence uh, patterns that 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 form around people and events. So or maybe it's some combination thereof. Yeah. Or or yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but 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 it's, it's um it is interesting. I mean, um, 
instinct comes into play, not just, uh, you know, anyone who's good at anything they do, whether even if you're a soldier or you're, uh, you know, a teacher or you're a coach or you're a manager uh, or you're an engineer or you're a scientist or you're a musician, instinct comes into play. It's one of the biggest, most underrated X factors uh, in the course of uh, people and events. And uh, certainly um, th- that instinct, is, how do you measure instinct? You know, is it natural? Is it calculated? Maybe some might say that it is. Um, it's just so advanced we can't we can't uh, articulate it. But um, if I say that I work on instinct, people say, "Oh, that's crazy!" You know, what do you? There's no such thing as instinct. But everyone knows there is. So I, I, you can easily extend the same thing to uh, meaningful patterns and coincidences that are happening uh, throughout you know the timeline. I don't see why not because it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, intuition or instinct is uh, very underrated in, in this culture. I was recently talking with Dr. Nick Bagich, who was the guy, co-author of The Angels Don't Play This Harp, about the harp uh, array in Alaska. And very interesting guy. He's an expert on mind control. Uh, his his dad was, was killed by the, the usual suspects, the same people who killed JFK, took down the plane with Hale Boggs and Nick's dad. It was right after the election in 72 that Nixon won. And he, of course, would later be Im- impeached. Uh, but, yeah, as apparently they took down that plane with Hale Boggs, who is the guy in the JFK movie who alerts the Jim Garrison character, played by Kevin Costner, to the fact that the Warren Commission was full of it. Right? He's, he was on the commission. Hale Boggs was on the commission. And so he, he told uh, Jim Garrison that you know, their commission was a crock. And uh, anyway, they took down that plane with, with uh, Baggage and Hale Boggs in fall of 72. So Nick Baggage grew up having his dad killed by the same guys that killed JFK, and that sent him on a path of you know peeling back the, the surfaces and looking for what's crawling around underneath. He's been doing it ever since. Anyway, he said that he has learned to really uh, trust his intuition and instinct to the point that it's you know he, he's able to be guided through life doing this uh, mm-hmm. routinely. And yeah. It's sounded, you know, a lot of successful people, Kevin, uh, will say the exact same thing. I've I've heard it from many different people that I would consider very successful, like in their field, like the top, you know. And they say that they say they they, they go through life, they make all of their decisions and their plans, and they strategize based on intuition and instinct. And well, Nick, uh, yeah. yeah, and Nick said that you can develop this. He he says meditation develops it, and both ordinary meditation and then these kinds of enhanced forms of meditation, binaural B technology and things like that. Uh, meditation apparently connects the two hemispheres of your brain. Human brain, you know, is, has these two largely independent hemispheres connected by this thin thread called the corpus callosum. And when your two hemispheres are in a normal state of consciousness, they're out of sync. They have totally different brainwave patterns because they're running independently. But when you meditate, and your brain waves slow down and you start getting really relaxed and peaceful, your two hemispheres start to sync up. And yep. it slower your brain waves, the more they sync up. And this supposedly actually, according to Nick, uh, builds up the corpus callosum so that you get more communication between your brain hemispheres and that the input from that right hemisphere, the holistic processing unit, Uh, can be injected into your ordinary consciousness, which is normally more focused in the left hemisphere in this culture, where we're so logical and linear. And so you get these intuitive uh, flashes. And, you know, so he says you can actually enhance your intuition through meditation. Yeah, yeah, it's called coherence. So when the... uh the, 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 you got the different brave brain waves, the delta, the theta, all the different uh, frequencies, uh, different hertz. Each of them correspond to a different electrical hertz. And then when they're both, uh, like you said, uh, when you're meditating, then you have coherence and they're basically vibrating. The waves are the same size on both sides of your brain. You can actually see it on a, co- there, uh, there's, there's, there are computers that, uh, can image this, uh, according to the electrical, uh, activity coming out of the brain and you can actually you could theoretically using the biofeedback uh, train <laughs> train you to sort of do this with a visual aid but but people have been doing it for thousands of years without computers so uh, it's not necessary that you need uh, any fancy gadgets to achieve that I think they've been doing it in Tibet for about six or seven thousand years yeah yeah, well, there's the Sufi meditation too. It involves chanting, and a lot of these meditation forms do involve a, 
kind of uh, chanting uh, these formulas, whether it's Om or the mantras or Sufi vicars. But I, I think I hear I hear some uh, brain entrainment noises going on. <laughs> I have to entrain my brain right out of this show. But hey, uh, thank you so much, Patrick Henningsen. It's always great talking with you. I appreciate your uh, astounding insights. Thanks, Kevin. Take care. Okay, you too. Patrick Henningsen of 21st Century Wire. I'm Kevin Barrett of TruthJihad.com. Go to TruthJihad.com and click on the radio link. You'll find out all about these shows. You can even join at TruthJihad.com. I'm going to be traveling for a while, so I may not be on the live show the next couple of weeks. Let's see y'all when I get back.